All right, folks, let's get started learning something about the basic neuroanatomy of the brain, the basic structure of the human brain, and all brains, really. Uh, you've already learned the body directions and planes. Uh, let's go ahead and learn a little bit more detail about the structure of the brain. So here we're looking at a human brain from the side. Uh, you might now recognize that as a lateral view. We're looking at the lateral surface of the brain, in this case the left lateral surface. And <clears throat> you've, first you can see that the brain is divided up into a couple big sections here. There's this big uh, wrinkly part up here, and then the smaller wrinkly part down here. We'll learn later that this is the cerebrum, and this smaller wrinkly part is the cerebellum. Let's go ahead and give that a cut right here. Do you remember what kind of a cut or plane that would be? That's a coronal plane or a coronal section, also known as a frontal section. And if you cut the brain like this, this is about what you'd see. At least this is usually about what you'd see for one hemisphere. In this case, it would be, I guess, the left. And then this is what you would normally see in the brain of somebody with advanced Alzheimer's disease. So this is more or less the same coronal plane through the brain of somebody who died in the late stages of Alzheimer's disease. And you can see how shrunken their brain is. The, uh, the folds here, the, the cracks or crevices have become widened. And then the bulges in the brain have become shrunken. There's more the the empty space in the brain. This is normally filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, these empty spaces in the brain or spaces filled with cerebral spinal fl fluid are called ventricles. This is a nice healthy narrow ventricle. This is called the lateral ventricle and here you can see this one greatly enlarged. The brain tissue has been going away. The neurons shrink and then die off in Alzheimer's disease. We'll learn more about this later. And as they do, more and more of the inside of the skull is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Anyway, let's focus on the healthy looking side of the brain here. The first thing you want to notice when we cut the brain is that you've got different colors in here, sort of different shades of beige. Uh, and we broadly discriminate between the darker colored parts of the brain and the light colored parts of the brain. The darker stuff is called gray matter and the lighter stuff is called white matter. So all this darkish stuff here, there's sort of a thin sheet of it covering the whole outside. It's all folded up. And then there are some chunks of gray matter on the inside as well. And then everything else is white matter. All in here, this lighter colored stuff is called white matter. Now, <clears throat> to understand what these different parts of the brain are and what they do, you need to understand what the brain is made of. You're going to learn this in the video that you're going to watch this week for Chapter 1.1, Cells of the Nervous System, if you haven't already watched that yet. But let me give you a little preview of that if you haven't already seen it. This is called a neuron. So this is the basic building block of the human brain. Uh, the, a typical human brain is going to have something like 80 to 100 billion of these. It's hard to know. It's hard to count exactly. Uh, but our best estimate is somewhere between 80 and 100 billion. That's billion with a B. So quite a few. Um, this isn't exactly drawn to scale. Typically, this part here, called the axon, is going to be quite a bit longer than this. But it really depends. Some, some local neurons, local interneurons, might have a short axon like this but it usually wouldn't have the myelin sheath on it. Okay, so let's take a look at the structure. So neurons have an, a cell body or soma right here. This is a, a prototypical neuron. Not all of them have this exact same structure, but uh, this is typical. And then inside that is the nucleus. Again, in the video, the other video you're going to watch, um, you're going to learn more about the structure here, but I'm just giving you an overview so we can understand basic neuroanatomy. Coming off the cell body are the dendrites. These are the information receiving end of the neuron. What's not shown here are dozens or hundreds of other axons coming in, making lots of branches like this, and then each of those branches having a little axon terminal at the end, 
making a synapse or a point of communication along these dendrites. So these dendrites are receiving information from several to hundreds of other neurons. The axons of other neurons come in, they branch out, and they make synapses here. But those aren't shown. So this is receiving information from other neurons, processing that information, and then having action potentials, which is going to be uh, what we're going to start learning about next week. These electrical impulses called action potentials travel down the axon and then travel down each of these terminals to the synapses where they then communicate. This neuron then communicates with other neurons, usually by making synapses with other neurons' dendrites. Again, not shown here. Okay, so you've got cell bodies and dendrites on one end, the information receiving end, and then you've got these long axons. These can be up to three feet long in humans. And you can see that the axon is covered with myelin, typically. At least the really long distance neurons are covered with myelin. As we'll see later, they help speed up those electrical impulses. The myelin sheath, you might know, is made of fat. It's a fatty sheath. It's actually, it's really just the cell membrane of an, another type of cell, in this case a Schwann cell, wrapped around and around the axon. Kind of like a, a tortilla wrapped around a big long, a big tortilla wrapped around a hot dog. You got a tortilla here wrapped around it, tortilla here wrapped around it. The tortilla is really the cell membrane of the Schwann, Schwann cell. And uh, a cell membrane, you might remember from your high school biology class, is made of a phospholipid bilayer. Lipid is a fancy word for fat. So it's basically a fatty sheath surrounding the axon here. Now, if you've ever had a nice marbled steak, my apologies to the vegetarians and vegans out there, you know that the fat is kind of whitish, uh, maybe, maybe a pale beige or white color, just like the white matter in the brain, all in here. The white matter in a brain is white because it's composed mainly of myelinated axons, which are covered in fat, which is white. Uh, there are some cultures where it's common to eat the brain <laughs> of certain animals, and it's not very good for it. It's high in cholesterol, it's high in fat, it's very rich. Um, doesn't taste very good. I've tried it, uh, to me anyway. But it's a delicacy in some places. Anyway, so it's fat. All this in here is uh, axons covered in fat. If we were to zoom in, you'd just see lots of little lines. In fact, that's what we're doing right here. Let's zoom in on this section here. Here's the cortex. It folds in and out, in and out, in and out like this. So the outer part is the cortex. It's made mainly of cell bodies and dendrites, as we're going to see. But in here, you've got white matter. And you can't see it too well, but there are, it's made of lots of little lines. There's some dark spots in there, too. Those are going to be the cell bodies of uh, glial cells. But in there, you've also got axons, the axons of neurons covered with myelin, which would make it white. So imagine here's your cell body, here's a cell body, here's a cell body. You've got dendrites sticking off that cell body. Imagine this is part of the cortex. This is that thin outer layer of gray matter surrounding the brain, all this stuff here, right? And then coming off each one of these neurons is an axon. Here's one here, long axon, long axon. Maybe it makes a branch, maybe not. These axons then become, they leave the cortex and become part of the white matter inside the brain. So here it is again, here's this gray matter, here's some white matter. So the white matter is going to be mainly myelinated axons, all this stuff in here. So when you see white matter, think about, think of it as like cabling. Think of it as fiber optic cables, just carrying signals, relaying signals from one place to another. Not a lot of information processing going on in there. It's just relaying information, signals from one place to another. And as we're going to see, those signals are binary. They're either on or off. 
again, just like a computer. Okay, so that's the white matter. And then the gray matter out here and in here is going to be composed mainly of somas and dendrites, cell bodies and dendrites. There's axons in there too, but uh, they're typically not myelinated until they leave the gray matter and become part of the white matter. Okay, so again, here's white matter. And then this uh, sheet of gray matter, one continuous sheet of gray matter that covers the whole outside of the cerebrum, this big outer part of the brain, is called the cerebral cortex. Cortex is the Greek word for bark, like the bark of a tree. And it kind of looks almost like the bark of a tree, except that it's all folded up. But unlike the bark of a tree, this isn't just something on the outside of the tree to protect it. This sheet of gray matter is absolutely central to pretty much all of the functions that you would consider the higher functions of the mind. We'll learn more about that later, and we'll learn about the different parts of cortex and what they do. So here's the cerebral cortex. It's all folded up. It folds in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. If our cortex wasn't folded up like this, our brain, our head would have to be about three feet in diameter in order to accommodate this, this surface area of cerebral cortex, right? If it was just smooth. So for example, um, rats and mice, they have a smooth cortex. But over the course of evolution, cortex expanded. The sheet that covers the brain, this thin layer of gray matter called cortex, cerebral cortex, the sheet got bigger and bigger. It had more and more surface area, but uh, you, couldn't, you can't expand the skull indefinitely. It's just not practical. So nature solved the problem. Evolution solved the problem by folding it up, folding it up like this. So the, the sheet folds in and out, in and out. Uh, in class, normally I would take a sheet of paper and fold it up, fold it up, and show you that I could squeeze it into a walnut shell. So almost a, a square foot of paper can fit into a sheet of walnut shell, shell if you fold it up enough. That's what nature has done with our cortex. Generally speaking, the more intelligent a species, it's hard to compare intelligence across species, but generally speaking, the more intelligent a species, the more cortex they have relative to the volume of their brain, relative to the, to the mass of their brain. We have the most. Uh, we have the highest ratio of cortex relative to the overall mass of our brain. And we also have fairly massive brains compared to the size of our bodies. Okay. And then down here, again, you've got subcortical gray matter. Uh, gray matter that's underneath the cortex. So again, both of these, cerebral cortex and, gray, and the subcortical gray matter, also known as nuclei, these are both gray matter, the dark stuff in the brain, mainly somas and dendrites. And then the white matter is going to be mainly myelinated axons carrying signals, electrical signals, from one chunk of cortex to another, or one chunk of gray matter to another chunk of gray matter, sometimes one part of cortex to another part of cortex, or maybe carrying signals from let's say motor cortex, which controls movement, down to parts of the body, down to the spinal cord, which then controls different parts of the body. Or maybe this white matter is carrying uh, signals from different parts of the body, uh, sensing touch, for example. Uh, those touch signals travel up the white matter of the spinal cord, white matter of the, the brain, and then make synapses. Those axons make synapses or points of communication with neurons here in the cortex. We'll learn more about that later. So again, the cerebral cortex is a continuous sheet of gray matter surrounding the cerebrum, which is this big front part of the brain here. Now, I told you that the cortex is folded up. We say it's convoluted. Those convolutions mean that there are inward folds and there are outward folds. Here's an example of an outward fold. This is called a gyrus. An outward fold of a cortex is called a gyrus. Here's one here. An inward fold like this, or like this, the cracks or valleys 
of the cerebral cortex are called is called each one is called a sulcus. So here's a sulcus, here's a sulcus. These are the valleys, and then a gyrus is going to be a hill. So all of the cortex, all of this folded up sheet of gray matter that covers the cerebrum is either out on a gyrus or down in a sulcus, out on a gyrus or down in a sulcus, out on a gyrus, down in a sulcus, and so on. One continuous sheet, if you follow. Each hemisphere, each half of the cerebral cortex, left and right, is covered by one continuous sheet of gray matter. Now, I'm going to draw your attention over here for a second. So these words, sulcus and gyrus, these are Latin words. And because they're Latin words, we make the plural differently than we would in English. So an outward fold of, a, of the cortex is called a gyrus. That's the singular version of this word. Several outward folds are called gyri. So you've got one gyrus here, and you've got one, two, three gyri here. An inward fold is called a sulcus, right here, for example, or here. Several of those are called sulci. So you've got one sulcus, several sulci. The hard C, uh, followed by U, becomes a soft C when it's followed by I. This is a little bit like alumnus and alumni, right? In Latin, you make the plural differently. It helps to say these words out loud. I know it probably feels funny. You're sitting there in your house or wherever uh, watching this video. It really helps to learn the not just the pronunciation, but also learn the words themselves. It helps you remember when you say them out loud. So let's do that now. Here's a gyrus. One gyrus. Say it. One, two, three gyri. One sulcus. One, two, three sulci. All right, good. Now. Let's quickly take a look at this right here. So this is almost like we've zoomed in. Imagine that we've zoomed in on this little chunk of the brain right here. Here's the midline right there. Here's the skull, the porous skull. Now in between the skull and the brain, so this sort of orangey part here, can you tell me what that is? That's the cortex, that's the cerebral cortex, that thin sheet of gray matter, all folded up, covering the cerebrum. And then here is, yes, the white matter. So here's the white matter, mainly made of myelinated axons, gray matter, like the cortex, made of uh, mainly somas and dendrites. Okay, so this is the brain. The stuff from here to the skull is not brain anymore. Now we're outside the brain. It's made of three layers called the meninges. You may have heard of meningitis. That's an inflammation uh, as a usual result of infection. When your brain gets infected, you get meningitis. It can be viral or bacterial. Bad news all around. <laughs> um, anyway, so the meninges have these three layers. You've got the dura mater, which is actually made of two layers, uh, but usually we just think of it as one. The arachnoid and then the pia mater. Notice there's one T in here. It's not the word matter. This is mater, which is a Latin word for mother, like your alma mater is your nurturing mother, right? The school that you went to, your alma mater is your nurturing mother. This is your dura mater. This is your tough mother. Dura like tough or durable. And it is. We'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you this uh, a little bit later. It's almost like a, it looks like wet paper, but it's much, uh, it's much tougher than wet paper. And it surrounds the entire brain like a sack, almost like it's been vacuum sealed. And then just outside the surface of the cortex, sort of hugging the surface of the cortex, shown in pink here, is the pia mater. Pia means small, and it really is small. You, you, really, you need a microscope to see the pia mater. It's that thin. You wouldn't be able to see it with the naked eye, just looking at a brain. But if you were to slice the brain, you'd see it. And I'll show this to you a little later. So that's the pia mater. They get the name mater because it was thought that these, uh, these membranes kind of nurtured and protected the brain. And uh, they do sort of protect the brain. Uh, they don't really nourish it, although these blood vessels shown in uh, blue and red here, they do nourish the brain. 
Anyway, in between the pia mater and the dura mater is the arachnoid layer, <coughs> uh, which has subarachnoid space in here. So you can see this black part. These are really, this is just cerebral spinal fluid. In between, these little fibrils, these little um, kind of filaments that extend between the pia mater and the dura mater. Almost looks like a spider web, which is where it gets its name, the arachnoid. But again, these spaces are filled with cerebral spinal fluid, and they're also, they also have a lot of blood vessels running through them. You may have heard of a, a subarachnoid hematoma. If you, if you bump your head really hard, sometimes you can burst one of these blood vessels and basically get a blood blister on your brain, which is much, much worse than a blood blister on your skin because that blood blister is going to sort of press onto your cortex and can damage it or at the very least uh, impair its function. But those are the crucial things you need to know about basic neuroanatomy.